um, that'll just be the uh, the content. And so we're still talking about hash functions. Are you guys ready to go? Yeah. So at the um, at the end of class last time, we were talking about um, hash functions, and we had just gotten to like we got through the the desirable properties of hash functions, which were um, the hash outputs are a fixed length, um, so usually 256 or 512 bits or something like that. Um, the message can be arbitrary long, ar arbitrarily long. I'm having a hard time spelling and writing and talking at the same time. Arbitrarily long. Um, so that means that it doesn't matter whether you hash like a 4K file or a 4 gigabyte file. Um, you can do it and you still get the same um, same length output, and so you want you want all of this to happen relatively quickly. So efficiency, um, and now these are the three security properties: um, pre-image resistance. Anybody want to say what that what that means? What is pre-image resistance? What can you not do with a pre-image resistant hash? Doesn't that have to do with like duplication? And yeah. It means that if I if I write like um if I write in a text file I love you and then hash it, um you shouldn't be able to take the hash and then recover the message. That's pre-image resistance. And then there's second pre-image resistance, <clears throat> um, which is kind of similar. But um, anybody remember what second pre-image resistance is? This means if you if you have an example of the hash function, like you have x and h of x, then it should be impossible for you to produce some new thing, like let's call it you know x naught or something. So that the the hash of x naught is the same thing as the hash of x. This is different than x. And the very last thing is sort of the uh, the strongest one. So this is collision resistance. <clears throat> so these things, you know, we we talked about the bad contract, good contract thought experiment about how um, a lack of collision resistance in general um, could lead to an attack. But it's really like specific attacks tend to exploit one of the two of these. And then this is sort of like a, a little bit of overkill that's just kind of intended to make sure we're safe. Like to do, to do, the, um, this, to do a second pre-image attack like on a digital signature, you at least need to be able to find a collision. So the, the hope is that if you can't do a collision, then you can't even begin to, to, to attack, um, to do the signature attack on, on the second pre-image. Um, for this one, the pre-image resistance is a little bit different. This, this would be for things like um, password hashes. So you don't want somebody to get the hash of your password and be able to recover the password. You know, this is why Companies don't store your password on their server so that if the um, if somebody breaks into their system and steals that file, which is called a shadow file, it has everybody's password hash. But that the person who steals that file can't then go on to log in as the users because you have to put in the pre-image of the password hash to get into the system. So because they can't go from the password to the pre-image. Um, it's not as bad of a security situation. You know, in practice, there are all kinds of attacks on, on um, password files that you'll probably do in, in, for, in your capstone class or something. Uh, you can look up dictionary attack, rainbow table, table attack, and play around with stuff like that over the summer if you want to. Also, you can, down, you can probably download some, some things to attack too. Um, so, all right. So now we're going to talk about the actual implementation of um, of hash functions. So there's a little bit of history here, and I'm just I'm just aping what's in the book. So there was an an influential um, algorithm written by Ron Rivest, and and it's amazing how like the guys from RSA are still just like all over cryptography 
in all kinds of different ways, like and especially in this public key stuff, like every time you mention something, it's one of these guys, Rivis, Shamir, Alderman. So MD4 was a was an algorithm of uh, Ron Rivest that was proposed in um, 1990. It probably seems like forever ago to you guys, but I was like, I don't know, um, adolescent, I guess. Um, and it produced a 128-bit digest. So that seems sim silly now because we just learned last time that with 128-bit uh, digest, you only get um, 64 bits of collision protection, um, which is not adequate, but um, um, I guess maybe it was harder to do a 64-bit collision in, in, the, um, in the 90s, and they were also just kind of figuring this stuff out. Um, so the, the basic design of MD4, it's an example of, uh, of a, a hash that's based on um, something called the merkle damgard construction, which we're going to talk about in a second. So it, um, it has a lot of security problems, but it's been very influential in, in the design of um, some subsequent, subsequent algorithms. So MD5 came out in 1991 to correct some um, security vulnerabilities in, in MD4. And this hash became extremely, extremely popular. It's still 128-bit hash. You can, you can see remnants of MD5 on the internet still today. So it's still a popular algorithm for like checksums. Um, like if you, uh, I've been doing this work with big, big uh, genomes and it, every time you download a genome, they give you an MD5 hash so that you can check it once you get it on your local machine. And it will, it will detect, you know, it will give you, it will, it will definitely predict, protect against accidental um, file corruptions that happen during uh, transmission. So does just the protocol for downloading it. So it's kind of funny that they, that they also give you the, um, the MD5 hash. But um, so if it were a strong hash function, then it would also protect against malicious alterations of the, of the, uh, the file. Um, this also happens when you download like a, a, a Linux distribution. You'll be given the MD5 ha hash to make sure that it hasn't been like uh, surreptitiously corrupted in some way. But um, because MD5 is actually a broken hash, it's possible to find collisions. And so it's really not strong assurance. And I think it would be fun and not too hard to actually um, change the um, change the genes inside one of these genome files so that you get an MD5 collision. Um, and then maybe you could make a blog post about it just for fun. So some, some kind of like um, fun afternoon for the summer maybe. And so, okay. So in 1995, um, which is the year I graduated high school, um, NIST, the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, which is often sort of like the public face of the, the NSA where things like this are concerned, um, published a hash algorithm called uh, SHA's SHA, which is a secure hash algorithm. But this turned out to be just the first of, of many um, secure hash algorithms. So people now call it SHA-0. And it, um, I think that the next year it was almost immediately replaced with SHA-1 after someone noticed some flaw. And this provides a 160-bit digest. And um, so when our, our textbook was written in 2012, so this, there are two, thing, two ways in which history has moved on since 2012. Um, one is that um, people have, have found ways to um, create meaningful collisions, like um, they, can, they can take two documents that actually make sense, like, you know, they're PDFs, I'll show them to you in a second. But they are, they, they collide, even though they're different files. So SHA-1 um, collision resistance has been broken just in the last few years, that was 2017. And, um, okay, and the other thing I'll mention in a second. So SHA-1 was for many years the most popular, um, most popular hash used on the internet and um, a lot, a lot of digital signatures were produced using SHA-1, which are now um, vulnerable to um, various tricks. And so, you know, going, going forward, SHA-1 should not be used. Um, 
so in 2001, um, the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology published um, SHA-2. Um, but SHA-2 isn't just a single algorithm, it's a, it's a family. So you're given a range of options depending on uh, the digest size that you prefer. So there is um, SHA-256, which gives a 256-bit out, uh, output. And um, there's also SHA-384 um, and SHA-512. So um, these are all similar but not identical algorithms. We're going to go over SHA-1. So these, these things are still variations on the same basic idea from all the way back from MD4. They're just um, improvements and fixing previous problems. So in, um, and as far as, as far as anybody knows, these are, these are still secure. Uh, also from quantum cryptography. So quantum cryptography is not an issue for, um, for hash algorithms, at least the, the published quantum algorithms that people know about, which are mainly just Grover's algorithm and, um, and Shor's algorithm. There's no way that anybody knows of to, you know, compromise the security of a, of a hash function in a significant way. Um, in 2015, um, NIST declared um, uh, SHA-3. So there was a, a contest for SHA-3. And um, the winner of this contest was an algorithm called uh, KICAC, which was produced by a team of people, including um, Joan Damon, who is one of the, the two people that proposed um, the Rindell cipher that became AES. And um, so we'll, we'll talk about this. So this is not based on the MD4 idea. Um, so all of these that we just talked about here, these are based on an idea called the, um, the Merkle Dam Guard construction. Just realized I'm going to have to write Merkle Dam Guard again later. So this A has a little bit of a halo over it. Is anybody from a culture that uses that halo and can say for sure what it does to the pronunciation of a letter? Merkle Dam Gird, Dam Guard, Dam Gade, I don't know. So, um, but the KCAC uses a new idea, which I believe was proposed by the, the people who actually, um, who actually proposed KCAC also had this idea of a sponge function. So we're gonna, um, time permitting, and it will permit, because I'm just gonna keep talking. Um, we're gonna talk about the sponge, sponge, uh, sponge function too. All right, so uh, let's, let's talk about Merkle Damgard. Okay, and for some reason I find writing that annoying. So I'm just gonna copy this and paste it down here. So here's the, um, the basic idea with, with Merkle, Merkle Dam Guard. It's based on, um, first you have to break the message up into blocks. This is sort of like, um, here X is just some long message. And just the way when we studied block ciphers, we, we, we broke the, the message up into many different blocks. The same thing happens with um, Merkle Dam Guard, and um, so this last this last piece has to be padded, and that turns out to be kind of a a, a tricky element, just like it was for um, block ciphers. And you have to do it for the same reason, you know, like uh, any any of these hash algorithms that we've been talking about. They'll have a block size. So I believe um, I believe it's 512 bits. Uh, anyway, that's it's it's often 512 bits. So you'll have some some big message which might be you know um, a couple kilobytes or a couple gigabytes. It has to be broken up into an even number of 512 bit chunks. And you you base the whole thing around just one um, just one function which is called the compression function. And I'm going to use f for the compression function here. Um, so the compression function takes two inputs. One is a message block. Um, there's some initialization vector here. Some people might also call this h0, like the initial state of the hash algorithm. And um, so this is this is not 
but maybe H0 is better because the IV looks like something that you could change if you wanted to, but you can't change H0. It's just um, part of the definition of the hash algorithm, you know? So like MD5 uses a certain H0 and it always uses that H0. It's not adjustable. Um, okay, so this produces um, some output. And um, so the output here is exactly the same width as that. So, um, and now you just um, apply the compression function, the same compression function to the next block of the, um, of the message like this. Okay, and then something comes out, which is the same width here. And then you just keep doing this. And it's called the Merkle Damgard construction because um, Merkle and, and Damgard independently, I don't, I don't think they did it jointly, they did it independently. They proved that if you have um, an F, a compression function F, that is itself collision resistant, um, then uh, according to some fancy mathematical definition, then the Merkle Damgard construction will result in, in, in a, um, a collision resistant hash. So in order to, um, in a collision resistant way, hash an arbitrarily long message, you really just have to have a collision resistant way to hash a fixed length message. And then you can use the Merkle Damgard construction to turn your fixed length hash into um, a hash that takes arbitrarily long inputs. And so what comes out here is um, the hash of the message. So in practice, um, there's a, if you look on Wikipedia, they'll say sometimes there's like a little finalization step. Um, there's some, some danger here, which is um, if you just do this naively, kind of the way that I did it here, the final step um, kind of looks like an intermediate stage and in some, longer, some longer process. Like if, um, let's just say that we did it naively the way that I've drawn it there. And then um, some some sneaky person who downloads the the code from the internet and can you know do anything they want with the compression function, they they add some extra little part here, and now they have um, they have this. So what have what have they produced? They've produced a, a hash of um, a hash of x concatenated with y, um, but they've so they've produced this without knowing x. And so this isn't, this isn't something that we've explicitly stated as a property that hash function should not have. But um, because of various things that people want to do with hash functions, this is actually bad. So you're, here you're, this, this is called an, um, a length extension attack. Um, and we don't want it to happen. And the, the bad thing is that the attacker can produce, so the attacker knows um, the hash of X concatenated with whatever, usually something that they choose, um, uh, without knowing X. So it's not, it's not quite like a pre-image attack, but it's kind of like that because you, um, well, no, it's not exactly like that. It's something kind of different, isn't it? Without knowing x, but you can produce the um, you can produce the hash of x concatenated with whatever you want without knowing without knowing x. Okay, so this is not this is something that you don't want a hash function to uh, to be vulnerable to. So that brings up the um, the issue of uh, padding. So padding can can prevent that. So Merkle Damgard padding. Um, so this this is itself kind of a kind of a tricky issue because if you do if you do your padding in a sloppy way, um, that can lead to collisions. So now let, let's consider consider a naive approach to to padding, which of course I'm stealing off the internet. So suppose there's there's some message this is from some Wikipedia page. I think it's the Merkle Dam Guard page. So if you have some um, some message uh, hash input. 
So remember we said that the, a typical block size is like uh, 512 bits. Um, so this, whatever, what is this? This is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is nine times eight is uh, 72 bits. So this is way less than a 512 bit block. Um, so it has to be padded in some way. So, um, you know, a, a naive thing to do would just be to, to fill out um, 512 minus 72 with uh, just zeros. So I, I say again for emphasis, this is the, the naive thing, okay? Um, so this is just naive zero padding. So the problem with that is that um, this M1 will have the, the same hash as a message that just is hash input followed by a whole bunch of zeros. So now suppose it's it's the same thing, but um, but this is just the message itself. So this is 512 minus 72. Um, so under this naive scheme, the second message M2, maybe just to make it clear, M1 is just hash input. Um, and so hash input is padded out by the naive padding scheme so that it looks like this. But what we're saying now is what if the message just is that? Then it gets no padding and what you'll have here is a hash collision with the hash of M1 being equal to the hash of M2. Okay, so that's you know a terrible, terrible thing. Um, so to stop that from ha happening, um, people do um, something else. Um, so uh, a more typical thing, so here's what, what's the non-naive. Um, this is what is done in um, SHA-1, for example. <coughs> you, um, instead of just appending zeros, I think you append a one, and then the number of, of zeros you need, okay, out to the end. Um, except at the very end, you reserve um, 64 bits. So here's, here's just the, um, the message. So the message takes up this part. Um, you, pad, you add a one and you add as, as many zeros, so um, now this entire thing will be 512 bits or whatever the, the block length is. These last 64 bits are reserved for the length of the entire message um, in bytes. So, you know, this is just what happens on the last block. You have previous blocks over here. So the entire message is all of these previous blocks. And then the last block, the last block is the only one that needs padding. And then these last uh, 64 bits are for L, where L is the, the length of the message. So you can see that, um, that that solves this hash collision problem that we just talked about. And this is the, the padding, this is a common padding scheme used for um, hash functions. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's look for a second at how to build a um, compression function. So this kind of ties in with another idea, which is um, making hash functions from, from block ciphers. So block ciphers have a lot of the, the message, uh, a lot of the, the properties that you would like a, a hash function to have, um, except that uh, they're, you know, block ciphers only in, encrypt one block at a time. So when we, when we we're doing, Merkle Damgard, here's the, here's the compression function. It takes a, a little bit of the message and it takes some, some previous state, which is HI, and it produces um, some new state of the hash algorithm, HI plus one. Um, so it turns out that it's bad for security purposes if you can take HI plus one and go back and um, you don't want to be able to know anything about the previous hash state from HI plus one. So you want this to be um, a one-way compression function. So the one-way part um, means that you can't take the I plus one state and then learn anything about the, the previous state. 
So there are several ways to, to do this with, uh, with a block cipher. Um, so let's take h i minus one. Sorry for changing the indexing here. Um, so suppose you put this into um, a block cipher. So this is just going to encrypt one block. But um, you use the message as the key, um, or a little part of the message as, as the key. Um, then what comes out is, um, is hi. OK, so this is, this is sort of an idea for a compression function. Look, you can see it's basically the same. Here, I'm drawing a slightly different diagram. But um, you have the message going in, and the previous state going in, and then the subsequent state going out. So that's pretty good. That looks a lot like a, um, a compression function. The problem is that this is not one way, um, because um, block ciphers are invertible. So if you know xi, then you can you can just go right back to the previous state. So people don't want that to happen. Um, so in, instead of just naively doing that, you can take this and then XOR it here. Um, and now you, you can't just send this backwards through the in, encryption function and, and get the previous state. This idea is called the um, Davies, um, Davies Meyer uh, construction. And it's one of several different constructions um, that um, makes a, a one-way compression function out of a block cipher. So it makes a one-way compression function oh, Sorry, I got caught up with my Skype window, I mean my Zoom window. So it makes a one-way compression function from a block cipher. And this is basically the way the, um, that SHA-1 works uh, from a block cipher. All right. And just, just for fun, let, let's look at, at one other idea like this, another idea for, for making a compression function from um, a block cipher. It's sort of the, um, what you might call the dual of this idea. So you could take um, xi not as the key, but as the input to the, to the block cipher. And then you could take the, um, the previous state of the hash algorithm. Um, and the way this, this idea is usually expressed is you have to go through this function g. And so what this does is it just transforms this into something that's the right, um, the right bit width for serving as a, as a key to, to a block cipher. Um, so this is playing the role of the, the message in the block cipher. And now this is playing the role of the key. <clears throat> and what this function g does is it just, you know, in case this is too many bits, you know, this might be 512 bits or something, and, and so you need to run it through g to make it be 128 bits or whatever the key length is, and then what comes out is you call it um, hi, except you have this invert invertibility problem that we talked about last time. So you solve that the same way by taking this XOR. Okay, and this one is called the... Matthias Meyer, um, and I don't know how to pronounce that name, um, but uh, Osage, I don't know. Um, okay, so now let's go to um, to CoCalc. Anybody have any questions? Comfortable? So let's come back to, to CoCalc, and I have some slides here. And if I haven't given these to you guys, I, I will give them to you um, soon. So let me see if I can make this as big as possible. Um, so some of this is just historical notes. We've already talked about um, what MD5 is and SHA-0. SHA um, so now we're talking about uh, SHA-1. And we're going to go through a little bit of the details of, of SHA-1. So it's, uh, it's, um, it's a merkle damgard based hash function that uses a, a compression function that's based on the um, Davies-Meyer construction. And the, the, the block cipher that's used is this um, a, spe a specifically crafted block cipher that's sometimes called SHA-CAL. And here's how sort of one, one iteration of the compression function works. So the, um, the state of the hash is the encryption of the um, the message and the, the previous state um, plus the, the previous state. Um, 
where M is playing the role of the key and H is playing the role of the plain text. Um, and here it is in, um, in pseudocode. So the, the pseudocode is, is good, but let me also show you just a, a picture that I stole from the textbook. Um, so hopefully you, this is a little, this is kind of abstract, but hopefully you can recognize the, the Davies Meyer construction in here. So this is that XOR that we talked about, right? This stuff right here, I wonder if I can, this will be a miracle if I can get this to work. Like, okay. So this stuff is the, is the block cipher SHA cal. Um, and so this is that big XOR that we talked about, except it's not really, XOR in this case. It, um, so each one of these, each one of these is um, is just regular addition. These things are 32 bits, and so it's just ordinary 32 bit integer addition. And if there's some rollover, which there probably will be, then it just it just gets rolled over. So it's sort of like addition modulo two to the 32nd power. Um, and then this this stuff in the center here is um is the block cipher so you'll 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 hopefully find this a little bit familiar from when we were talking about block ciphers because it it happens in um it happens in rounds so you can see that there are uh, four stages and each stage is 20 rounds um here is one um one piece of the message so this is the block of the message i think it's 512 bits it's playing the role of a, of a key. So when we when we did AES, you might or DES, you might remember that when you're given a key, it gets broken down into a key schedule, and just one sub key is used um, during each round of the block cipher. So that's that's what happens here. Um, so the the message gets broken down into a message schedule. So there is a um, one one sort of sub message so that's like a piece of information that's influenced by by the message um, that gets factored into each each um, each one of these rounds um, what's happening here is this is just saying like for for this what changes between these stages so each one of these stages uses a different part of the the message schedule um, in every part there's a there's just a constant called k and the, the constant that's used changes from round to round. And also each stage um, uses a nonlinear function and um, which nonlinear function is used changes depending on which stage you're in. But there's not really much difference between all of these four stages except for, for those um, properties. This is a really nice diagram that makes a lot of things very clear. And um, You'll notice that the width of the state here is 160 bits, um, which is also the, the width of the output. And um, yeah, so that's that's good because that is how it works in the, uh, the merkle damgard construction. So this is one compression um, as part of a merkle damgard construction. And if you, this explains most of how SHA-1 works. We'll come back here. Sorry, it's not letting me get out of here until I stop drawing. Whoops, I went to the wrong place. Here we go. Okay, so here's some here's some pseudocode. Um, so this is the uh, the SHA-1 um, compression function. Um, so it uses it does the block cipher, and then this is the XOR part. Except it's not really XOR. It's just respective um, 32 byte, sorry, 32 bit addition. Um, here's the block cipher. So first you expand the message into the message schedule and then for 80 rounds um, you do this. So the, the, here's where the pseudocode is lying to you because it completely ignores the, the thing about the stages, right? Um, so, uh, well, maybe not because this f takes i as a, as a parameter. So I think they've just swept that part about using different nonlinear functions at different um, in different stages into the dependence on this parameter i. So it's mixing things around and then it mixes around things some more. Um, this is the this is the part of the code that actually does the um, what you would normally think of as key expansion in the context of a block cipher, but it's message expansion. 
Um, it's a lot like the um, what, what happens with AES. Um, you know, this is very similar to how the key schedule gets produced for AES. There's a, this turns out to be a weakness of, um, of SHA-1. Um, it turns out that this is too simple. And when they, when they implemented the SHA-2 family, um, they made this more complex. Oh, and so this is telling you about the different stages. So this is, this is what the nonlinear function is in stage one. This is not nonlinear function in stage two. This is nonlinear function in stage three. This is nonlinear function in stage four. Okay. Um, so in 2005, researchers found a theoretical weakness, which would uh, give a collision in two to the 63rd operations. But um, so Google actually has done this, and you can follow this link to Shattered I.O. I actually have the documents that have the same SHA-1 hash in this directory. And this is actually hashing them, and you can see the collision here. Um, let, me, let me show you the PDFs. So here is um, Shattered 1, just has some stuff in blue. Here is uh, Shattered 2, has some stuff in red. So you can see that they're not the same file. Um, so this is kind of like that good, good contract, bad contract idea. And um, whoops, I went back to the wrong place. So, um, so SHA-1 is, uh, it still has, I think it still has pre-image resistance, but it doesn't have uh, collision resistance. So you can't use it for any application that requires collision resistance. So now this, this kind of sketches out um, SHA-2. So one, one big, big difference between the, the SHA-2 family and the SHA-1 family is that the, the this um, key expansion um, part of the algorithm has been complexified. So it's not just an, an XOR with, uh, with a bit shift now, it's, um, it's much more complicated. And um, so far as anybody knows, um, SHA-2 is, is still uh, secure. So there's also um, SHA-3. And uh, SHA-3 is, is QCAC. Uh, let me just show you uh, how, to, how to do these things from the command line if you want to play around with them. So somewhere in, so right here. Yeah, um, so you can, lots of, I mean, so if you want to do MD5, that's like MD5 sum. If you want to do SHA-1, you can do um, SHA-1 sum. Are you guys seeing this? Make sure my speaker is on. <laughs> is that a yes? You guys can see it. Everybody just asleep. Yes. OK, cool. Yes. Um, so this is, this is SHA-1. And then these other things, I didn't mention this, but this is a, another member of the, uh, the, SHA, the SHA-2 family. And it's for triple, triple DES. So all, all of these numbers are supposed to match other security levels. You might remember that triple DES has a security level of 112 bits. And so this has twice that because to have 112 bit security, a hash function has to have twice that many bits because of the birthday paradox. Um, and uh, so here's SHA-1. I actually don't know what SHA-SUM is. But to use, uh, to use SHA-3, which is KCAC. By the way, SHA-3 is not exactly KCAC. Uh, KCAC the, um, the NSA changed a couple of parameters, which of course has like um, made the hyper paranoid crypto community. Some some people are reluctant to use it. Like if you're a cryptocurrency fan, you might know, you know, cryptocurrency depends a lot on hashing for proof of work and Merkle trees and all kinds of things. Um, but uh, in Ethereum, they they don't use SHA three. They use KCAC because it might be that those uh, parameters that were added by the NSA. Um, you know, somehow weaken the algorithm. But anyway, so here I've, I've just hashed a, a pretty big file, which is um, actually a recording of a previous class. And with, uh, with SHA-3, it takes, um, it takes about twice as long as with, uh, with SHA-12, uh, with a SHA-512. They both produce a 512-bit digest. So this one, is, this one is from the SHA-2 family, and this one is, is uh, SHA-3 with uh, 512 bit output. So this this doesn't say anything about the algorithm. It might just say something about the implementation. You can find um, other speed comparisons on on the internet. But anyway, that's how you use the things from your command line if you want to. 
Um, so now I'm going to look at the um, the Wikipedia article on on uh, on Shaw three. So Shaw three, it it's not based on a, it's not based on a Merkle Dam guard construction. It's based on a new idea called a sponge function. Um, <laughs> So a sponge function is, is a cool idea. It's all based around this, um, this function f here. Um, so just think of this, this part is the state. Um, and it's some number of bits. I think in, in the case of Kikak, it's 1,600 bits. And um, so this r part is going to be the part that's actually used for the hash. And it, it's adjustable. So let's say that you want a a 512-bit hash, then um, this R part will just be the top 512 bits of the entire 1600-bit state. And um, this other part is called the capacity. And um, the size of the capacity has to do with the, with the security level of the, um, of the resulting hash. It's just sort of a store of extra entropy. And this function f you'll see is, is always the same. So this is just some uh, permutation, not on the bits of the state, but it's a permutation on 1,600-bit states. So um, f is a, is a very complex function. It's sort of like a, a little hash function in, un, unto itself. But um, unlike a compression function, um, the, you know, there are as many wires coming out as going in. So with the compression function, you know, there were fewer output bits than there were input bits. But here there's the same number of input bits and output bits. So they call f a permutation instead of a compression. So basically it just amounts to repeatedly applying this complex function f to the state. Um, as you go along here, you're adding in um, message blocks. So again, there's like, you know, you have to pad out you have to pad the message out into these different chunks, and this they call this the absorbing, uh, the absorbing phase, where the the sponge, quote unquote, is like absorbing entropy and information from the message. So after this stage, you're done putting information into the sponge, and now you keep running it, but instead of instead of putting in information, you squeeze it out. So this is the squeezing phase. And um, then you, you just squeeze as many times as you need to to produce um, to produce a hash of the of the desired length. So I think I lied earlier when I said that R is five twelve. If you want a five twelve bit hash, I think it could be it's less. And then you squeeze this as many times as you need to to get five hundred and twelve bits out. Um, so depending on how long you want the hash to be, you squeeze more times. Um, and uh, so there's no reason to stop squeezing. So this could actually, you know, generate like, a, you know, a, lo a long pseudo random number, sort of arbitrarily long um, output, and they actually have a name for that. They call they call that uh, shake. Um, so um, this just produces like a, as much this. Okay, so maybe we should go over this table. I wish there was a way to just look at this table. Um, so these. Um, these are the, the security levels. So just think of what these what these are for is, is just for you to be able to see at a glance what the what the security level of the hash is. And of course they correspond to the security levels from SHA2. Um, but what you what you can look at here are the um, so remember the, the entire state is 1600 bits. So some of that is reserved for capacity and some of that is used for the rate. Oh, the rate is the uh, the block size of um, the block size of the message. When you pad the message out into blocks, the rate is the is the um, this the size of a of a message block. Um, so you just do the uh, the process that we just talked about, um, and now when you you would only have to do one squeeze in this case, and then you just take the first two hundred and twenty four bits that you get in the very first z. And that would be the hash, um, and the uh, half the capacity is the is the security level. So you'll notice if you cut the capacity in half here, you get the um, security level for the pre-image and, and second pre-image attack, and that's a, that's a rule here. So the um, whatever they they set aside for the capacity, if you div just divide that in two. Um, that's the uh, pre-image and and um, second pre-image security level, and it looks like the the collision. Security level is um, is half that. Okay, 
All right, so um, if you multiply this by four, that's the size of the capacity. So your collision resistance is, um, is one fourth of the number of bits in the capacity part of the sponge. Um, yeah, so you can see that as the, so right, so as the, as the security re requirements are going up, the capacity is going up too. So to get 512 bits of, uh, of security, um, this actually, right, okay, so this corresponds to SHA-512. So even with SHA-512, you still only have 256 bits of collision resistance. So that's the same as with SHA-3. Um, and it's, it seems like still you only need one squeeze to get out 512 bits. Um, but with these, this other idea is with uh, the shake algorithm, it lets you just keep squeezing as many times as you want. So D is the number of times that you squeeze. And um, so shake 128 gives you 128 bits of security and shake 256 gives you 256 bits of security. You can see that those relate to the size of the capacity. And, um, and you can squeeze it as many times as you want. So now you can, you can make your own hash function. If you want a one megabyte hash, you can just use shake 128 and then make D the appropriate number. Uh, okay. So I think we, we did it. We actually finished class on time. I don't have anything else to say. Any, any questions? One cool thing about cryptography is, you know, this is somewhat cutting edge. You know, the uh, SHA-3 was only published in 2015. So, I mean, it's only like five years old. It's a, kind of a, a new idea. Usually in math classes, you you only learn things that were discovered many, many years ago. Any, any questions?